Nokia lecture, and it's an honor to bring Joe Federson out to campus today. Um, he's been working in the studio with us over the last few months doing prints that are going to be opening up in the 511 gallery this week for the first Thursday opening, so please join us for that as well. Um, just to want to say a few things, uh, we'll keep this short since we're in the lunch hour. Uh, Joe's a member of the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation and lives and works in OMAC, Washington. He is uh, has a status of faculty emeritus from Evergreen State College where he worked from 1989 through 2009. Uh, he was given the Luminaries Legacy Award from the Museum of Northwest Art. Uh, Joe has been in numerous exhibitions, currently is represented by Froelich Gallery in Portland, Oregon. Uh, he's represented in the Whitney Museum of American Arts, the Heard Museum, Philadelphia Museum of Arts, the Smithsonian, uh, the Portland Art Museum, and many others. Uh, I could probably spend another half hour reading all of his accolades and things that he's done. So. Uh, please welcome Joe Fetterson. <laughs> it seems so strange to look out there at all dark and <clears throat> um, it's it's been a pleasure working with you with you guys, uh, Matt and uh, Mac and and um, Travis and and Skyler and and everybody else. I, I can't remember all of the people. It's been a real pleasure. As as uh, Matthew said, I uh, I retired about ten years ago, and I really miss working with younger people, with students, and and that's been the one thing that's been uh, something I've been searching for in this kind of communication with people talking about art, because. Uh, OMAC is pretty desolate, but from the time I'd, I'd left, I grew up there. I, I always knew I wanted to come back. My uh, my grandmother, she always said, uh, you need to come home. You need to be part of the community. Uh, your people need you, and uh, and it's important to be part of your own community. And uh, so I was gone for, for basically 40 years. I went to, uh, to school, and I and I became an educator, and I'd always had it in my mind I was I was going to go home, and and be with my people and and work there, and and that's been a really wonderful thing, uh, because it uh, it it makes you part of a community. And uh, when I was talking at when I was teaching at Evergreen, I I worked at a tribal based program, and I and I saw one of my students, and and we went to the grocery store, and somebody said hi to him. I said, well, well, who was that? And he goes, oh, that was my niece. And I thought, wow, how lucky he is to be in, in the midst of his whole family and, and, and to do his work. And I really, uh, I really envied him that, uh, that you can do that and be part of the community and do your work. And, uh, and I've been working on that ever since because uh, when you're in a native community and you come home, and especially after you're gone for 40 years, uh, you have different histories, and it takes a while to become part of the community again, and uh, and and do things like uh, to know every every time you go to the post office, you end up running into somebody you know, and and just being part of the community. So, so that's that's been really a wonderful thing for me to do after I retired. Um, I really envy you too because it's been forty or. 45 years since I was a student. And I, I went to uh, Wenatchee Valley College and the University of Washington, and, and uh, I received my MFA from uh, um, University of uh, Wisconsin at Madison. And, and you guys are in this wonderful thing where you're surrounded by friends and you're able to, to draw on these relationships to, to support yourself and, and to be, uh, part of this and uh, and that's that's amazing because these people that are around you today you're going to know them 40 years from now and uh, it's a wonderful thing I, I used to tell my students at evergreen that that they should they should meet at least three people a month 
go out and do things and be part of this. You know, you have this really wonderful opportunity with all of these people that are that you're working with and doing similar things to. And I have to admit at Evergreen, sometimes I'd walk into the studios and there'd be three people and they'd each be in different corners. And you're thinking, gosh, shouldn't they talk to each other? Or, you know, they're having such isolated experiences and, uh, and this whole world of getting to know and to network with people is, is just there for them. They should take advantage of it more. So I would, uh, I would encourage them to meet just three people a month to, to get out of your comfort zone and, and to, to sit with somebody and talk about your, your projects and your class and, and everything because you're going you're gonna to know these people. And if you only meet three people a month, by the time a year is gone, you almost know 50 people. And when you're as old as I am, you know a lot of people. And I try to go out and I try to meet people also and, and be part of it, be part of the arts community and to be active in it. And, and that is one of the, the best things about what you're going through now that, that you get to, to, to talk to everybody and to, to work side by side. And being in printmaking, we always helped each other. When you're printing, we would, we would uh, help, uh, help print. And that was really a wonderful thing. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to show a bunch of pieces, just kind of different se sets of work, and kind of show how I got to where I am today a little bit. I'll try not to bore you too much, but uh, well, I'll work on that. So. Uh, uh, this first piece is uh, called, uh, this is called Sound Transit. And um, when I came back and I started teaching at Evergreen, I thought, I want to make work that's about me, about being a Plateau Native artist, and to incorporate that as part of my uh, relationship to my work, instead of just solely being totally autobiographical, I wanted to tie it back to my culture. and. I did that by incorporating basket designs and about looking around me and seeing, seeing what's there. What, what is it about contemporary life? And you'll see that on this piece there's uh, um, some red triangles and their, their delineation is a mountain design. And, <clears throat> and there's also other things like uh, the black parking lot design. And there's also salmon gut designs and everything is, is meshed together. So if you knew things about plateau culture, you would see these designs emerging from, from this background, this kind of a maze or matrix of, of designs overlaid on a grid. Uh, these pieces uh, uh, fueled more work. And I, wanted, I was asked to do a, a solo show at the Hyde Center in New York. And I was making baskets. And I was also, I, I wanted to do a piece that, that fit the space. So I made this piece, it was for the, the Hyde Center, in, it's a kind of in Battery Park in New York. And this one incorporates several designs. These hourglass figures are actually, they represent the abstract design for, for a woman. And the triangles with the, the pointy side down are butterfly designs. And those black and white kind of crosses those are actually star designs. And there's several other designs that interweave back and forth. These are all plateau designs. And, and when, when, they, when plateau people see these, they see these designs emerging from this. I was, uh, I was learning how to make baskets because I, I was basing these on designs from basketry. And I thought, you should learn. And, and I was very lucky to find someone to show me how to make them. And the one in the front is a, uh, was one of the pieces I didn't want to replicate old baskets. And so the one in the front is kind of has an urban design. It's called a cinder block. And it's a traditional uh, basket shape from where I'm from. And it's made of glass. When I, was, when I was asked to do this show, I thought I was making these baskets. And they were only about six or seven inches high. And I thought, how do you make them bigger? And I asked a friend of mine, uh, Kathy Thompson, and she said, oh, I have Preston, uh, Preston blows my vessels for me. So I, I contacted Preston Singletary, and I worked on, uh, with him on these first ones. 
that was about almost 20 years ago. These are some of the other designs. Uh, the one, you know, chain link and cul-de-sac. These are the ones that were like six inches high and about four inches across. And here's the cul-de-sac and uh, it looks blurry, I guess. Um, boy, this is a surprise to see these things. Uh, and parking lot, this is uh, the glass one and the and the other one, uh, uh, and the woven piece. Boy, this is why you look at your slides blown up before you do a thing like this. <coughs> I started a, a suite um, with this first suite. Uh, uh, tire track designs were uh, were just kind of uh, stylized, and they didn't really mean anything. It was just you know this is a, a reference to the kind of uh, marks on the land, and I thought I wanted to get more specific. I wanted I wanted to to do fire tire tracks that that were drawn from uh, from real things, and I was fascinated by the fact that these tires have amazing names like like Firehawk, and and I found other ones that have designs like uh, Winter Forest, Open Country, Wilderness, Rugged Trail, and I was fascinated by the fact that all of these SUV tire tracks have these kind of romanticized Western names to them. And, uh, and that became a whole suite of work that, that referenced these things because uh, a lot of times our designs are, are taken from the world around us. And to realize that these are the new marks on the land, that uh, these SUV tracks are, 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 are being pulled from what's around us and, and they're actually um, embedded into the landscape today. Um, this one's Rugged Trail. And I go back and forth between different media, as you've probably noticed. And this was a, a piece I made for an exhibition in New York. And, and it has a, a, a really prominent mountain design and star design. But it also has an eagle design drawn from the, fire, from the tire tracks. And <clears throat> and I think it's open country design, two tire tracks overlaid. And these are uh, relief prints printed on a Vandercook press, um, pretty much 14 inches square. And so that piece is probably 10 feet by about 22 feet. The one at the Smithsonian was about 12 feet by about 65 feet. And um, so again, it's kind of meshing these, these traditional designs with the new designs laid on the landscape. Um, the next suite of work, I wanted to draw from, uh, from kind of Art Deco, kind of chrome and black. And to a lot of times they reference native work in, in like Art Deco. I thought, well, my work, I think I'll reference Art Deco work. And I made these, uh, I had these vessels blown at the Museum of Glass. And what I did was I stenciled on the inside and then brought them to a place that mirrored them. Um, and so this is a suite called um, Urban Vernacular. And each one of those, uh, the one in the front is, uh, is one called uh, Highway with HOV Lanes. Uh, the, one in, the other one is a uh, clear cut. I think there's a high voltage tower and parking lot. And, and you can see in the background, there's a whole set of prints that, that were made to work with these. So a lot of times I'll, I'll do my exhibition and uh, I'll have multiple ways of approaching the same amount, the same work. Uh, this is looking down on that, that same exhibit. And you can see these kind of line pieces, that kind of line drawing. It references uh, uh, this piece, which was, uh, was, was at the um, um, Sun Valley Art Center in, in Ketchum, Idaho. This was the first time I made Charmed. Um, it's a glass curtain or a, or a blanket, and it references uh, hybrid culture. And it talks about different, uh, when, I, when I was asked to do this, I proposed three things. One of them was to make a, a wind chime. 
and a charm bracelet or a, or a petroglyph wall. And this, the charmed combined all of those. You can, uh, it's kind of a petroglyph wall when you see the shadows, when, uh, when movement occurs around the piece, it sounds like a chandelier. And it's all made up of little charms, like from a charm bracelet or from cracker black boxes or different icons from uh, pop culture. So these are some of these things. Some of them are from uh, petroglyphs and you can see like the, the big uh, kind of Thunderbird image in the front. Um, other times, this is a piece I made for uh, um, Spokane Falls Community College as a percent for the art project. It's, uh, it's about 10 feet across and about 50 inches high. It's, a, it's a, a fish trap, a plateau fish trap. And uh, it's suspended in a, in a staircase at the, at the gateway building at Spokane Falls. So I was, I was also making baskets and I was making new designs and, and this one's called Roll Call. And when I was thinking of Roll Call, I was thinking about um, uh, winter, um, winter counts, things that are about the world around you, what happened, what, who's alive, and also kind of merging it with like high school photos of the class and who's there and what are they doing now. And, and kind of things like that. And so this is, uh, this one has like a chef and a chief and, and it has like a television person and an alien and, and different kind of animal people. And it's about the world around us and who has survived, who's around here today. And uh, different things like uh, the one on the bottom, there's like a, this one is uh, that one's a that one's a portrait of my dad's cat. It only had one ear, so it's it's not a mistake. That's what the cat looked like. And uh, the one on the top in the middle is like a, um, a horn toad from my childhood. You would go out and you catch horn, horn toads, and and right below it's a praying mantis. And it's just about things around us. And so this is a basket, and I did an exhibition at the Froelich Gallery called Roll Call, and these are all fused glass, and they, they're referencing the basket that you just saw. You have different things like uh, uh, whirlwinds and um, uh, just a lot of different characters. Some of these are at the Portland Art Museum. Uh, this is a piece I made for the Evergreen State College, and it's a piece of, that's called uh, The Changer. And in this piece, it references a Salish legend, and it, and it goes something like this. Um, when the creator came to the Puget Sound, he gave all of the peoples different languages, and, and the people couldn't communicate, and things were different then. The world was, the sky was lower, and people kept going up into the upper world, and it was causing a lot of chaos. And what happened was that the people came together, and they somehow figured out that in unison, they would take these poles, and they would push up on the sky. And the people that weren't participating, that were up in the upper world, when they, when they pushed on the fourth try, the sky gave way, and it, and it came up. And the people that were up in the upper world became uh, the constellations. And uh, what I did, it was a public art project, so I went to a lot of classes and I told the story and I asked people to, to submit portraits of themselves to be incorporated into this. And so that's why all of these little ones on the bottom are all very different. So you can see the diagonals and and those little crosses or stars up in the, for the constellations. Uh, 
And uh, from this piece, uh, I think uh, Skyler's here, and Skyler worked with Melanie. Melanie does these uh, print projects all the time. And uh, one of her print projects was called uh, Going Home or something like that. And what happened was I was doing Charmed, and I, when you look at Charmed, there's a lot of times there's these little canoe figures. And so I used one of those as a, as a reference for going home. And all of a sudden that reference turned into a whole suite of work that became, um, that became Canoe Journey. Because a, a lot of times my work references what's going on in the communities. And I was really fascinated by the fact that canoes were being built again. People were coming together and they were having canoe journeys. Um, that's happened on the coast a lot, but it's happening in the plateau area also, where, where people are really making new dugout canoes, making new versions of old canoes, and, uh, and coming together. And so you see like different characters that, uh, that reference my other things in my work. A lot of times our stories have um, um, animated uh, plants. You can see like a tree person is there and you have like animals that are like referencing like, uh, you know, the praying mantis and so forth. So all of these things have a kind of per, uh, personifications of different animals. When I, when I was working on these, I thought these would really make great things in clay. I could just see how they would look in clay. And I, and I made a whole suite of, of clay pieces that were about the canoe journey. And you can see like uh, way up on the left, upper left, there's like coyote in a inner tube. And there's different people uh, on this front one. There's like a tulip person and a parking lot person and, a, and an alien behind them. And then on the far right is like a, a flat screen television person. These were meant to be in a room with, that's blackened. And so they would all kind of just float these little white white canoe people. So this was an installation at my studio in, in OMAC. Great. So, um, Um, so all of these things are working together and, and when, we, when we talk about the exhibit I'm doing here, uh, I was talking to Mac and, and Mac was saying that he wanted um, to show how the imagery of my work, it, uh, one thing leads to another and it transcends the media. So that, uh, um, you know, they're in ceramics, they're in glass, they're in printmaking and, and so forth, and they're woven. And that each part is, uh, it, it helps to inform the other pieces. So uh, this is the last slide, and uh, I was wondering if there's any questions for you. Um, she asked, uh, how much does assimilation come into my work? And um, I, it, it's hard to ignore that, that part. Uh, I try to. I, when, I, when I came back and I wanted to do plateau work, I wanted to do, to do work that was about, about home and, and about my people that would be adding to the community. When, um, um, I, when, I, when I studied at the University of Washington, um, I worked with Glenn Alps, he was a printmaker there. And people kept asking me, what, what did Glenn teach you? I was kind of uh, his uh, a protege. I helped him print his work at, when I was uh, at uh, UW. And they, they expect me to tell them that, that he showed me this, these secrets about printing collagraphs because he was like known for doing collagraphs. And uh, at, his, at his memorial, they, they wanted me to talk about his technique and, and, and Glenn never talked about technique. He, uh, we would sit there and, 
and he would talk about his ideas and about how how he saw the world. He was he was very Zen like, and uh, one of the things that he talked about was uh, breathing naturally. And when we talked about breathing naturally, he correlated that with when you go to the doctor's office, and when you're at the doctor's office, they tell you to inhale and they tell you to exhale. And then, they, and then they're through and they say, okay, now you can breathe naturally. And, uh, and you have to realize that when, when you're talking about your, your own life and about your perceptions, that, that you need to be at that state where, where you're doing your work and you're not necessarily thinking about assimilation or anything. You're just trying to do original work that comes from yourself, that's, uh, um, that, that comes from your insights and and that relates to what you're thinking about and, and where you're going with your work. Um, I hope that makes sense. An another, another way of uh, approaching that was uh, when I'm at home, uh, one, of, one of my elders, I, I think of her as an elder, her, her name's uh, Elaine Tymantois. She's a mas master basket maker. She's one of our treasures. And, and I go in and visit her, and when I finish a basket, I go to her office and say, hey, I finished another basket. And she usually tells me stories. And, and one of them was about, uh, about this petroglyph wall. And she talked about the, 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 the young people, you know, when they go through um, becoming an adult, you, you go out and you quest. And they would go to these, to these walls, the petroglyphs. And it wasn't really to, to necessarily, like, study and memorize the petroglyphs, but in part it was, this is part of your culture and part of your life, um, that you gain insights from that. In a, in a lot of native work, the stories have, have multiple meanings, and it all comes back to when you look at the work, you gain certain things from it, and you pull things from your own experience, and, and the same story may mean different things on different days, and that's okay. That's fine. She she talked about how how the how the youth would go to these places and they would add to this, that they would uh, they would add to the petroglyph wall, and a lot of times I think of my work as an extension of this tradition. I don't really think about assimilation, but I think about about being true to yourself and to to do work that's of interest to me. Okay. That's probably a really long version of, a, of what you asked, but I hope I addressed it, it well. I'm so, I couldn't quite hear you. that when I make my baskets, I'm, I'm interested in the object. Well, on, on the baskets, I, um, um, they, they, uh, I didn't include very many baskets. Um, but um, they, they usually tend to be a, a canvas for, um, for whatever I'm thinking about. Um, there, there's a story about um, when, uh, when the cedar tree uh, taught this young, young person how to make baskets, and, and it, it, talked the per, uh, it talked to the person about, uh, they were showing the, the, the young person how to make them, and they would and they would make the baskets, and the cedar tree said to the to the to the young person to the basket weaver, it said to to look in the world around you, and to to use these abstract patterns as as designs for your baskets, and so when I think about my baskets, I think about the world around me, and I incorporate them like with the um, um, canoe journey. I think about the world around me when some of the 
uh, baskets have like parking lot designs on them or high voltage towers or things that when you look into the landscape, you see all of these things and, and that informs what's on the baskets. Okay. So I, I graduated from uh, University of Wisconsin, and I came back to Evergreen. And uh, it's it's really a struggle sometimes to teach and to do your own work. And I thought I wanted to base my work on on these abstract designs from basketry. And and so I I was really fortunate because uh, Elizabeth Woody had just started uh, working in basketry. Does people know who Elizabeth Woody is? She's one of our Treasure, I guess she's the po poet laureate for Oregon, or she was. I think she, I think she still is right now. Um, and she and I have been friends for 40 years or something like that. And she was just learning how, and and so she taught me how to make baskets. And and I was, I thought, boy, you're really old. I was 40 years old, and and that's 25 years ago now. So I've been making baskets for about 25 years. And, uh, and that's how I think of the patterns. Um, I, I do include traditional designs in them, but a lot of times I will look at the world around me and, and put abstract designs from there. Any new techniques? Um, well, well, coming here, it was really, really great. Um, uh, when um, ar around 2000, I, I received um, a fellowship. It was called uh, an Idol Jork Fellowship. Um, it's uh, the Idol Jork is a museum in um, in Indianapolis, and. Uh, uh, the, this fellowship came with a, a $25,000 award. And not only that, but they bought a lot of your work. And, uh, and it, it gave me the freedom to do whatever I wanted. It, it enabled me to do glass and, and uh, some computer graphic work and um, experiment with different things. When I, when I came here, it, it reminded me of that because uh, working with Matthew and uh, um, and Mac, they, they, uh, they gave me uh, tremendous access to this place. I could never, the prints we made here were, uh, were printed uh, photographs off of Charmed and then uh, mono printed on top of Charmed. And you have uh, amazing facilities here that, that, that you can uh, print these high def images on uh, rice paper and then laminate them. Uh, with three layers of paper and then print the mono prints on top of them that I was just floored it was I could uh, say these things that I w was interested in doing and and they they instantly became true I felt very very spoiled being here and uh, it was uh, it was just so wonderful to have the access to all of the uh, facilities and the people to do whatever you wanted to do and I'm trying to think if I answered your question but I, I hope so. They were fused glass. Yeah, it's like uh, like you have that uh, area out there with the uh, mezzanine up above. It would be like it would be suspended out on top of the mezzanine, and it's at kind of uh, normal height when you're walking on the 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 second floor in that building. So it was in that in the stairwell, but it was suspended over the top. 
it was. I found out the hard way that when you, when you, it cost me $4,000 to just rent the, the scaffolding to put it in. It was amazing. I didn't think it would cost that much, but um, it was amazing that, uh, um, and, and it, the piece is made out of fused glass. So it, it was, uh, it was um, these long strips that were put on an on a aluminum armature. And yeah, it, 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 it references, uh, when I was at Salish Kootenai in Montana at Flathead Lake, I went to the, the Kootenai uh, Community Center and the, the, the Kootenai people are also plateau people. And, um, and they had this beautiful uh, fish trap on the wall and that's what I was referencing. Uh, you were going to ask another question. Well, usually I'm in OMAC by myself, working on my own. I, uh, I, I, I made, uh, you know, when I moved home, the first thing I did was I, I went to the high school and I invited the, the high school art teacher to have a cup of coffee, which was a really great thing. You know, I was talking to you earlier about going out and meeting people. And, uh, and I called up and, uh, and the, the high school teacher was Ken Vanderstoop. And Ken said, yeah, sure. So I went out and had a cup of coffee with him. And uh, he became my friend for like 10 years now. And, and he helped reintroduce me to people in the local community. And, and, uh, and that was really wonderful. Um, I'm trying to remember what, you're, what you asked. I forgot. <laughs> but, oh, and, and I asked him, I said, you know, do you have any high school students that because I would just love to have a student ha helper, and and one time they they sent out two st two girls. They were uh, uh, they helped me in print one time, but uh, one of them wanted to be a lawyer and the other one wanted to be a veterinarian. And when you're having a helper in your studio, you really want them to be artists because it, you invest a lot of time and energy for uh, for helping somebody, and you you want to help an artist. You don't want to help a lawyer. So, so I haven't been able to find anybody in OMAC to, to fulfill that, that need because I could always use somebody to, to help me do things and, and I'm, I'm all for it not being a solitary thing. I, I'd mentioned to you other times about it was the printmakers that, that worked collaboratively when I was at UW because we'd, we'd always help each other. And, and sometimes the painters would be down there doing it all by themselves. but. Uh, uh, the printmaking people were always helping each other. You would help them and, and they'd help you and it was amazing. It was, it was working together. I think I answered your question. And um, when, when you think about um, all of the different media that I work at, I, I, I also had another mentor when I went to, to the University of Washington and, and her name was uh, Vi Hilbert. And, uh, and Vi was, uh, was a treasure. She was uh, a Lushootsi storyteller. And she taught uh, Lushootsi language at UW and uh, literature. And uh, I took those classes, but I was way too old to, to learn the language because uh, you don't pick up a language when you're 30 years old as, as easy as a five-year-old. And, uh, but Vi was persistent and, and Vi, and Vi if I would see my work and, and she said, she said, Joe, uh, you're a storyteller. <laughs> and so I think it's uh, the storytelling that, that ties all of the work together. Okay. Any more questions? Or? Okay. Um, it's amazing to come to a place like this and, 
and to give, be given like free reign to do whatever you want to do. And um, I always think about, um, I've, done a, I've done other residencies and a lot of times when I'm at home, I think, why would I want to go any place? I have like tons of equipment to do stuff and, and I can do almost everything at home. But what I can't do is I can't make monumental work. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm really fascinated by, by work that becomes the environment, that, that builds on even that one piece that I made for, uh, for the Smithsonian um, at, uh, at the bowling, at the, at the Hyde Center in New York, the one that was 12 feet high by, um, by about 65 feet across. That was made up of, uh, of uh, 14 inch squares and there's 500 of them. It was this idea that you can make monumental pieces, but, but you can make them really small and that's a lot of them become the whole. And when we look at the installation in Charmed, you realize that while this is one piece, it's, it's made up of a lot of pieces. I think they said uh, more than 150. I have a feeling there's more like 500 pieces in there of glass that's, that creates the piece. And so this idea that, that when I came here that I could make things that I couldn't make on my own, including the fact that, that you have an Epson printer that, that can print these prints that are basically 40 inches across and, and 55 inches high. Um, I have no access to that at home. And that, and that when we made this piece, it was with the idea of doing a monumental piece, which we did uh, 10 vertical pieces that go together to make this huge kind of a petroglyph wall um, by, by placing them together uh, as a series across the wall that I could never do that at home. And, uh, and to work with other people with like Travis and Skyler uh, to, uh, to create these works that, that I just can't do on my own. And it's a, it's a really wonderful opportunity. Okay, did that? Any? I did, <laughs> I kind of gave them to Charles and he had his own idea how he wanted them displayed, which I didn't think was as, 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 as nice as the presentation is, is what I had in my own studio. And um, um, so I, I hope to, to do that sometime, but uh, uh, I'd have to re kind of reinvigorate them because a number of them have sold too. But that, that I would like to do that. It would be really nice for, uh, because I've always envisioned it as a space that, that's darkened, that you walk through, and it, that uh, uh, that you become part of the thing, the piece. Um, 